Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wendy Luger, the university librarian, and I, uh, it's my privilege to welcome you here this evening. Uh, a great event to celebrate the Michael McConnell files, uh, which have been donated to the Jean Nicholas Treader Collection in GLBT History. And you'll hear more about that collection shortly, but uh, it's an extraordinarily important set of documents that will measurably add to the Treader Collection. But first, I want to make sure and acknowledge Michael and Jack, who are here, uh, and to thank them for their generosity, but also thank them for the opportunity to do this, to thank you on behalf of the libraries and on behalf of the university. Truly a special moment. I think it's appropriate. We're here in the Elmer L. Anderson Library. Um, Governor Anderson once, uh, he was a person of wonderful quotes, but this one I liked in particular. What nobler purpose can there be for a university than to gather up the prizes of culture and to preserve them, propagate them, and make them available so that what has gone before can be preserved but also built upon? So it's no surprise that uh, Governor Anderson was instrumental in rallying folks together to build this extraordinary facility uh, to bring together all the distinctive collections that had previously been scattered about around the Twin Cities. Donating his time, his energy, and ultimately his incredible personal collection that had been gathered over the course of his lifetime. And he was also instrumental in bringing a number of other archives our way. But when it was time for the university to have an opportunity to acquire the Treader Archive, it was Elmer who voiced his support for including GLBT materials in our holdings. And I'd like to think that he is uh, happily with us in spirit today as we celebrate just how far we've come from 1970. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about all the wonderful collections here. Uh, they're international in scope. Uh, they're considered one of the top collections in the country in terms of size and exceptional depth in over 15 major collecting areas. <clears throat> but I think what's important is to reflect upon how collections come to be. They're often conceived when a passionate person wants to preserve history. And such was the case when Michael and Jack began to document their very personal story that now will be preserved and sustained and used by generations to come. And that's truly the power of archives, that uh, first hand, first person capturing of a moment in history. So Michael and Jack, we are honored uh, to accept the responsibility uh, for caring for and for sharing your archive in the future. And it's now my honor to introduce the president of the university, Eric Cato. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you for leading one of the nation's truly great university libraries. Uh, with us tonight are Provost Karen Hansen, who's here, thank you, and uh, the University's Vice President for Equity and Diversity, Dr. Catrice Albert, and Catrice will speak with you in a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to uh, add my special welcome to uh, Jean Nicholas uh, Treader, whose collection in GLBT studies is one of the nation's and, in fact, the world's most important repositories of GLBT history and culture. Welcome, and thank you, Jean. So here at the University of Minnesota, we teach history, we study history, and sometimes we make history. And sometimes we find ourselves on the wrong side of history, and we need to learn from that. But tonight, thanks to Michael and Jack, we're celebrating a truly extraordinary histories, the history that few universities share. The history of a remarkable journey for Jack and Michael, for the GLBT community, and for us as a university community. Our curator, Lisa Vicoli will fully explain the story behind tonight's gathering. But I know this, how the university treated Michael more than four decades ago, denying him a job because he was gay, was reprehensible. 
I regret that it occurred. And the actions by our university clearly and emphatically are not consistent with our values or our practices today. Those actions are absolutely opposed to the climate that I now, as president, and that our Board of Regents seek and promote. Dr. Albert will discuss some of what we're doing now in the areas of equity and diversity, but make no mistake that the University of Minnesota is dedicated to the fair and ethical treatment of all, and that we prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, as well as gender identity and gender expression. Thankfully, we have come a long way. For, for example, we are consistently listed among the most LGBTQ-friendly campuses in the nation, and we're proud of that designation. But the Michael McConnell files donated by Michael and Jack, who, by the way, was the president of the Minnesota Student Association, and I think you saw some pictures in the slideshow, tell us a history that shouldn't and now can't be forgotten. It's a history of struggle for equal rights for the gay and lesbian community, and particularly here in Minnesota. It's the story of the battles and victories of two courageous men. The Michael McConnell files are so valuable because Michael and Jack were pioneers, because they were at the start, at the middle, and saw the end of a movement that has now made great advances. And because they have saved, apparently, everything <laughs> that documents that period in their personal history in our universities and the nations, we have a wonderful resource for scholars for years to come. So Jack and Michael, we're grateful that you've shared these valuable documents, these important historical documents, with our university, as well as our scholars, students, and curious citizens for the generations to come. So on behalf of the entire University of Minnesota community, I am pleased to honor you to thank you for your gift as you have honored us with your years of activism, your determination, and your lives with each other. Thank you so very much. Thank you, President Kaler and Dean Luger. It is my privilege to be a part of this wonderful celebration uh, and an opportunity to honor not only our history, but also the work that we are doing right now uh, to be the living legacy of those who came before us. In our office, we say that equity and diversity is everyone's everyday work. And by extension, it's also everyone's responsibility to make the University of Minnesota a place where GLBTQ students, staff, and faculty can thrive. President Kaler already mentioned that this year was the fourth consecutive year that the Twin Cities campus was named one of the most GLBT friendly and inclusive campuses in the nation. There are a lot of people and offices whose time, energy, resources, and sweat equity are behind this kind of recognition. And of course, our, G our GLBTA programs office leads the way in that effort. The office is marching towards its silver anniversary, celebrating its 20th year of existence a couple of years ago, uh, making it one of the oldest such offices in the nation. It consistently partners with other units and groups to offer comprehensive training and education about GLBTQ identities and communities, as well as supporting research and scholarship focused on gender and sexuality. In April of this year, the program's office hosted the first ever Upper Midwest Queer, Indigenous, and People of Color Conference. In recognition of that groundbreaking uh, work and intersectional effort, the conference's two co-chairs, Jason Jackson, who's here with us tonight, and Zay Yang recently received the Moxie Award for Community Leadership from the P-Fund Foundation. We're so proud of their work uh, and their continued support of our communities. In addition to the trans-inclusive health benefits we offer, students are now able to use their preferred name on their university IDs, which is a very um, forward movement, a forward movement in university communities. And lastly, there are over 40 GLBTQ groups and initiatives to get involved with on campus, including student groups like the Queer Student Cultural Center, academic groups like the Minnesota Queer Science uh, Organization, 
and staff and faculty affinity groups like Pride at Work and the Transgender Commission, which has worked diligently for many years to expand the number of gender inclusive restrooms on campus. There's also so much more work to be done, but I'm always encouraged and energized by the efforts of people at every level of the institution to enhance our campus climate. So as I turn it over to Lisa, the director of the Treader Collection, I too want to recognize Jack and Michael. We get nowhere alone, and we thank you for being giants uh, on whose shoulders we stand and for giving back to the university and for sharing your stories with us. I think I speak for everyone when I say that we all appreciate the opportunity to learn from both of you as models of inclusive excellence. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm thrilled to have you here. Um, before I start, I just want to remind you that um, we have some of the materials from Jack and Michael's collection along the wall over there afterwards, if you want to take a look. And a few of the panels, uh, the history panels that we use at Pride and that we have available for display are on the wall over there. My name is Lisa Vicoli, and I am the curator of the Treader Collection. I'd like to thank you for being here this evening. And I'd especially like to thank President Kaler, our speakers, and our most venerable founder, Jean Nicholas Treader, for the archive that we have. Most of all, I'd like to thank Jack Baker and Michael McConnell. As a curator of the Treader Collection, it has been my sincere pleasure to work with them over the past three and a half years. And it's an honor that I appreciate more and more every day. Today, we look back on the history of marriage equality with the certainty of success. With 2020 hindsight, we can be sure that marriage equality will prevail. From Massachusetts in 2004 to the Supreme Court ruling just this past June, the Wikipedia version of history will be that marriage equality swept the land with a speed seldom seen in social justice movements. And that certainly is an exciting part of the story. But the full story, the archival story of Jack Baker and Michael McConnell is much more compelling. In 1970, Jack and Michael were the first couple in the United States to apply for a same-sex marriage license. And in 1971, they were the first same-sex couple to be legally married. To appreciate, yeah. <laughs> To appreciate the groundbreaking nature of their story, we need to remember the world as it was in 1970. Homosexuality was defined as a mental illness. Sodomy was a criminal act in 49 of the 50 states. And it was legal to discriminate against homosexualities in employment, in housing, in accommodations, and in any other way that you can imagine. In short, you could be evicted, fired, arrested, jailed, declared mentally ill, and institutionalized, all for loving someone of the same gender. And yet somehow, Michael and Jack dared to dream of marriage, of full equality. A friend introduced them to each other at a party in 1966, telling Michael, trust me, you two are destined for each other. When Jack suggested they move in together, Michael agreed on the condition that someday they be legally married. As Michael tells the story, Jack replied, well, I guess I better go to law school. <laughs> By 1970, Jack was a first year law student at the University of Minnesota and was active on, with FREE, the gay student group on campus. Michael was finishing work in Kansas City and looking for a job in the Twin Cities so that they could reunite. Their letters to each other were the exchanges of any lovers separated. Michael would send Jack multiple page letters with his hopes, his fears, and his feelings. Jack would reply with short postcards. <laughs> I miss you. I love you. Don't forget to renew the car tabs. <laughs> then in January of 1970, Jack wrote a longer letter. Quote, the more I thought about you and our relationship, the more I realized how society had kept me from really enjoying life by forcing a double life on me. It was because of you that I decided to unmask completely 
and demand respect. I haven't regretted that decision, but instead found a different kind of happiness in finding real friends. It gives me tremendous pleasure to talk about my lover in front of straight people and see them listen attentively. You saw Benny and Mike, how they acted. It's as though I've seen the sky for the first time. He closed the letter writing, someday I promise we'll be together again. That spring, Michael received a job offer from the University of Minnesota Libraries, and they planned to reunite in Minneapolis. In his legal research class, Jack learned that Minnesota statutes at that time on marriage did not include any language specifying gender. And so on May 18th of 1970, Jack and Michael put on suits and ties and went to the courthouse in downtown Minneapolis to request a marriage license. Their application became world news. Among those who heard about it were members of the Board of Regents at the University of Minnesota. In an act that was unprecedented, the board refused to approve the job offer to Michael. Lawsuits on the denial of the marriage license and the withdrawal of the job offer generated even more publicity, as did their request for a license in Mankato, which was granted before officials realized they were two men. On September 3rd, 1971, they were married by Reverend Roger Lynn, who continues to call them one of his more successful marriages. <laughs> Jack and Michael were in Look and Life magazines. They were covered in the local and national press. They were on television shows, including the Phil Donahue Show and the David Susskind Show. This visibility drew letters from around the world, England, Brazil, Colombia, Barbados, India, Australia, Chile, and other countries around the globe. The letters, most of them now over 40 years old, document the hope, the despair, the anger, and the determination of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. What makes the letters so remarkable is that they provide a window into the lives of people whose very survival depended on remaining hidden. But in this moment, they spoke for themselves. There were letters of support, sometimes with a dollar or two enclosed. Dozens of letters sought advice, including two lesbians, 19 and 20 years old, who wrote, if we did go through with the ceremony, would it entitle her to use my last name? We read about you and Michael in Look Magazine. It made us feel proud because it's the first time that we've seen anything about homosexuals printed in a national magazine. I believe it's time for the public to accept us. Another correspondent from Tennessee wrote, may I please extend to each of you my profound congratulations upon your recent matrimony, matrimony and convey my deepest felicitations for a productive and present life together. I am a homosexual who lives in agony turmoil and fear every moment of my existence. This is simply because no one has entered my bleak life as the two of you found happiness in each other. Maybe one day my need for steady human companionship and compassion shall be answered. There was another letter, 44 pages handwritten from someone serving in the Marines. This last subject I'm going to care, cover has been on my mind for four or five years now. It's something that has really held my interest. It's daring, yet so exciting. It's the subject of me becoming a female, a transsexual. I understand that it can prove to be fatal, but sometimes, well, most of the time, I feel that even living as a real female for five years would be almost worth it. I could literally keep you here for a week, reading letters of hopes and fears, tears and dreams. But instead, I'll close by quoting from a letter that Jack wrote in 1971. I'm glad you're trying to form a gay liberation organization. As you can see, it's a lot of hard work. But it's fun and very satisfying knowing that you're helping end the senseless oppression of gay people. I hate to see this, but as you have found out, sometimes those who will oppose you the most are gay people. I explain it away as a fear of the heterosexual backlash. A lot of gay people have written to us saying that we should just be quiet and live by ourselves and not make such a big deal of things. 
They say that if we continue to create publicity, that it will be an excuse for the police, etc., to start a campaign of open oppression. Unfortunately, I don't believe that, and I must act according to what I consider is the betterment of everyone. Times are a-changing. We're in the midst of a serious social revolution. Welcome aboard. The times have indeed changed, in large part due to the courage and vision of Jack Baker, Michael McConnell, and the hundreds of people who wrote to them. The Treader Collection is honored to hold these voices. In 50 years, I hope that young people will find their contents unthinkable. Most of all, I hope they will remember and honor those who fought so hard for equality and dignity for the entire gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community. I'd like to honor, to welcome our honorees, Michael McConnell and Jack Baker. 45 years later, their vision for mar marriage equality has come true across the country. Two years ago, my wife and I were honored to have them as guests at our wedding reception. And this evening, just three days short of the 49th anniversary of their meeting in Oklahoma, I'm delighted to introduce them to you. Holy cow. Um, I told Jack one day, did we really do all that? <laughs> and, but yeah, we did. And um, what I want to say today is going to be very brief. Um, the reason that you can listen to Lisa or President Kaler or other speakers here say the things that they've said about us is because we saved our history. And what I say to each of you is, do not undervalue your own history. S preserve it and present it to the Treader Collection. <laughs> the other thing I want to say is that as human beings, we are about stories. We tell stories. That's what we do as human beings, whether we're sitting around a campfire, the little Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, or we're sitting in a cave someplace in northern Minnesota, or we're sitting in a comfortable living room with a martini, we tell stories. That's what we're about. We write books, we do films, we write articles, and those stories come from the record we keep. For many cultures, that was oral. For us, it's print, and now, in the future, it will be digital. So it's very important to save your history. Our stories will generate thousands of other stories. But the Treader Collection, which has 6 million pages in 50-plus languages, will generate trillions of stories. So save your story and put it in the collection. When I campaigned to be student body president, I made a promise that we would make uh, uh, get students appointed to all of the committees that the, on the uh, for the board of regents uh, as non-voting members, and I was very happy to at the time the the president or the chairman of the board of regents was uh, uh, former governor when, uh, Elmer Anderson, the president of the university was Malcolm Moose. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, the, the, the regent's uh, activities in dismissing or, re or, or rescinding Michael's appointment 
to the to be a librarian had absolutely no effect on our relationship and between the the president and the governor, Governor Anderson and President Malcolm Moose, we were able to, uh, they made it happen that students are become what they call now uh, student representatives to the Board of Regents. And I'm very happy to hear that when I, my conversation with President Kaler, uh, that when he came here in 1980, he became a student representative to the Board of Regents. And so we've come full circle uh, in terms of the, the university and the, the regents um, and their activity. And now we here are celebrating, uh, looking back and reminiscing on what actually happened back then and forgiving all of the sins that occurred and enjoying the company of all of you today. So thank you very much for. Uh, thank you, Jack and Michael. Um, wonderful um, remarks and great to have you here with us. Uh, I hope you all will uh, take a moment to look at some of the materials from the collection that are on either side of the room. I hope you'll also take a moment to continue enjoying each other's company and to talk with Jack and Michael out in the atrium afterwards. And thank you again to our speakers and uh, all of you who are here this evening. Thank you. Good night.